so this this presentation is called exploring possibilities for the future with the homeschool students all of them are going to speak they've, they've got pretty quick presentations and i hope uh, we can uh, get started here uh, i want everybody to introduce themselves so you know i'm, I'm jim Laurie. I'm in Woburn, Massachusetts right now, and I'm uh, 71 years old. So uh, Astrid, go ahead and introduce yourself. Um, I'm Astrid, I'm 18 years old, and I live in Medford, Massachusetts. Um, I'm Asmund, I'm 14 years old, and I live in Medford, Massachusetts. I'm Jonathan, I'm 14 years old, and I live in Belmont, Massachusetts. Hey, I'm Shara. I'm 15 years old and I live in Medford as well. Uh, I'm Thomas. I'm also 15 and I live in Waltham. Okay, good. And uh, so let me, uh, we'll start the slideshow. This is kind of my theory drawn out of what, what uh, has evolved in my mind of how to, how to teach. And it's the idea of how do we create innovators and how do we get people that, uh, young people that can work in teams. And it also, you see here, I'm talking about scales. I, I want people to be able to think at their own scale, at a human scale, but also to be able to think in terms of how do, what are the microbes thinking about? And then also at planet, you know, how do they think about a, you know, astronomical kind of thing. So, so we've done cosmos, for, in, in, for instance, uh, we've done uh, human physiology. They're real steeped in Lynn Margulis and John Todd's work. Uh, but the basis of all this is chemistry. And uh, so here we are. Uh, this, is, this is Astrid. This is Asmund. This is Jonathan. This is his first day of class. And we've got the earth rise there. Um, then we went, uh, this is kind of the Kronosaurus attacked the class. And uh, there was a lot of panic. But you notice here, Asmund's uh, keeping cool. So that's really a good sign. So, And uh, this is the only picture I had of... Uh, of Thomas and Sharda over here. And we're working on the, this is the first day we got outside and uh, started building the living machine, but it was also our last class that we were able to have, um, you know, outdoors because uh, we've gone, you know, you see it's March 10th. So uh, we've been indoors ever since we've been on the, on the internet. So here's uh, the list of speakers. Charter's going to connect us up uh, evolution of dinosaurs in the Eocene and Miocene. Asmund's going to talk about grasslands. Astrid's going to talk about forests. Thomas about wetlands. And then Jonathan has some hopeful signs for us. So why don't we start uh, Sharda? So as you can see, this is a geological time scale of the various eras, periods, epochs, etc. The end of the Paleozoic that that blue spot over there is marked by the Permian extinction, which started the Mesozoic era and the Triassic period, which was when the first dinosaurs evolved. This is Coelophysis, one of the dinosaurs that evolved during the Triassic period. It was a pteropod of the family Coelophysidae, and it was discovered by Edward Drinker Cope in 1887. Even though it was like pretty common, Wait. Go back. It wasn't necessarily a dominant predator until the Jurassic started. Obviously, Coelophysis died out in the Jurassic and before the Jurassic, but okay. during the Jurassic, this dinosaur here is Guanlong. It's a theropod from the family Proceratosauridae. Believe it or not, it's actually an early relative of T-Rex, though T-Rex didn't evolve directly from it. So as you can tell by what I just said, Tyrannosaurs evolved during the Jurassic period. And here we have Spinosaurus. Now Spinosaurus is pretty interesting. It was semi-aquatic and it was a piscivore, which meant that it ate fish. It's also considered the longest theropod at 49 feet, like even longer than Tyrannosaurus sometimes, which is pretty cool. <laughs> and here is Archaeopteryx. Now Archaeopteryx is considered a transitional fossil by many. That means that it's 
a fossil that sort of marks the transition between dinosaurs and birds. And it is considered the most ancient bird that has been discovered so far. People have made models of it and discovered that it was able to fly, although not with any flight pattern that we know. And this is one of the dinosaurs that has survived in today. This is an emperor penguin. The earliest known penguin was Waimanu Marengi. And it lived in the Paleocene only like a couple of million years after the dinosaurs had died out. Kind of shows how they bounced back pretty quickly. I think it's interesting that you had a dino dinosaur earlier that was a fish eater and now we've got birds that went back into the ocean. Yeah, it's so. pretty cool. So here I'm gonna, gonna shift here. Could you say something about, just name off the, uh, the epics here. So these are the epoches. The first epoch is the Paleocene, then there's the Eocene, the Oligocene, the Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Holocene. We are currently in the Holocene. This is all during the Cenozoic era after the dinosaurs went extinct. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a shift here. And... This is a water plant called Azola. It's one of the main reasons that the ice age has happened. Here it's shown next to water hyacinths in our living machine. This is the chart of climate change throughout the epoches. Over here, it was 12 degrees above what we consider normal, which is pretty shocking. On the Paleocene-Eocene boundary, this little spike over here, labeled PETM, was a methane spike that marked one of the highest temperatures of that time. When temperatures kind of plummeted from there, why? Because of the Azola. The Azola was sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and cooling the climate. Started rising after a bit, but then it like plummeted even further because the grasslands were sort of doing the job of the Azola and taking even more CO2 out of the air, make, lowering the temperatures even further than they were before. And now, we are technically in one of the breaks in the ice age, but we're rising again by two degrees, which is pretty scary. You think, you think humans evolved in the ice ages? We're not really ready for really warm climates, I think. Yeah, we're definitely not fully prepared. <laughs> but Asmund is going to talk about how grasslands can help out with climate change and cool. how they can lower the temperatures again. Okay, thank you. Glassman, you're up. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about grasslands and how um, by bringing livestock back to the grasslands, we can really make a big difference with global warming. So if we kind of look on the right side of the slide, we can, there's like a diagram of how um, the difference of bringing livestock back can change the ground. So if you bring livestock back to the grasslands, they'll break the cap. Um, which is basically the really hard soil that's been oxidized by lots of sun hitting the ground. And then that will allow water to enter the ground as well as dung beetles to um, take the poop from the livestock and bury it and create humus, which is really, really good for the ground. Um, also, um, by allowing more water to enter the ground, that means that more grasses can come and um, that they take the carbon dioxide and turn it into oxygen and sugars and those sugars go to the mycelium which um, create um, glomalin which holds a lot of water. Um, in 2014 um, a group took a lot of buffalo and took them to Illinois and here we can just see how much grass um, has come from all these buffalo and in a little later slide you'll see kind of how little grass they there can be if there's none. Um, dung beetles can take a ton of um, manure in here. Um, there's like a little quote where this um, doctor says the beetles bury a ton of wet manure per acre per day, which just gives you an idea of how much um, they can really, they're efficient basically. Um, about 10,000 years ago, there was this megafauna extinction where there was actually so much poop on the land that um, there was an ice age. 
but we're kind of worried that right now there's very little poop on the land, so maybe a similar sort of event might happen. There you go. Um, so here, if you look on the top right, you'll see the grassland soil, and you'll see how much humus there is. It's really, really rich. But then if you look below it, you'll see the desert soil, and there's very little. And a lot of the grassland soil has turned into this desert soil because of um, over grazing and just not having livestock. Um, but I'm wondering if maybe if we can bring back livestock and bring back the dung beetles, if we can turn a lot of that desert soil back into that grassland soil. Um, here, there was so little um, grass on the ground that all the soil just blew away. And how much garbage do you think was lost per acre here? Because you can just see in the middle, there's a little spot of big blue stem that held its place. This is, this is what New Mexico used to look like. We probably lost 200 tons an acre of carbon, just pure carbon out of that soil. This is what it looks like now, if you can see some runners here. And you can just see how much, um, like how little grass there is in comparison to the ground. If you remember back to that Illinois slide where there was all those buffaloes with all that grass, there's just such a big difference. Here they brought out livestock and fed hay um, on a lot of really um, bad soil, basically. And in just like six months, it changed into grass and really fertile soil. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna hand it over to Astrid, who's gonna talk about forests. All right, so I'm gonna talk about water cycles and how forests have an important role in rehydrating the continents. So I just wanted to start off with this graph on the right. This was one of the first things that Jim showed me in our class and it really scared me because it shows the um, energy that is being absorbed by the earth and the different um, places in which it's being absorbed. And if you look at the little dark purple line at the very bottom, that represents the amount of energy going into the atmosphere. And the International Panel on Climate Change, when they made their models about um, how much carbon was being absorbed by the Earth, they just were basing them off this atmosphere, which as you can see, is just a tiny amount. And there's tons of um, energy going into the oceans that the panel wasn't considering until just last year. And when they started considering how much is going into the ocean, um, they realized that we have 10 years to help the situation. And the amount of energy is about the same as one Mount St. Helens explosion happening every six minutes. So it's tons and tons of energy. And I just thought that was really scary. So um, one of our heroes is Greta Thunberg from Sweden. I'm sure you all heard of her. She noticed um, that this was such a serious situation that she was trying to bring a lot of attention to it and she protested in Sweden. That sign says strike for climate, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. School strike, yeah. Yeah. So, and that was in 2018 and she's still trying to um, get attention about this because as you can see, we only have a little bit of time. Um, so one result of the oceans heating up so much is that there are tons and tons of serious storms happening as a result. Um, the oceans are just trying to get rid of all this heat. And so it's coming out in these um, hurricanes. So Hurricane Harvey is um, a strong example of this. This is a bunch of flooding that happened. These highways were actually 15 feet above water level originally. So it's just tons of water that the oceans are just trying to get rid of. Um, another result is that um, as the continents become more dry, there are a lot more forest fires, which is also a really serious um, situation if we get more and more forest fires. What kind of trees are these? Um, those are redwoods, and they, they are pretty resistant towards forest fires, but not if there are tons of them, as you can imagine. Um, so I'm going to switch to trees now. Um, this is the lady on the right is Julia Butterfly Hill. She's super cool. Um, I read the story about her earlier this year. Um, she actually lived in a redwood tree 200 feet above the ground for two years to um, protest against loggers who were clear cutting the redwoods. And as she did this, she just realized how important the trees are to the environment and um, how strong they are. Um, so in our class, we did a lot of chemistry and chemistry is, really relevant to trees because trees are um, highways from the atmosphere to the ground um, and 
a lot of the things that their highways for are all carbon compounds. So they take in carbon dioxide from the environment and then they produce glucose, cellulose, starch, all these really important things that are all carbon compounds. So that's really interesting to learn about. We'll get back to these words. Oh yeah, humus. So we're back to this really rich soil humus that we're going for um, that trees ultimately help to produce because of all the carbon that they're taking out of the air. Um, so mycorrhizal fungi, I'm going to talk about mycorrhizal fungi for a little bit there. Um, they live in the root systems of trees and they're super important. They have a two-way connection with the trees. Trees provide fungi with what they need and then fungi provide soil with um, nutrients and minerals. Here's an example of a plant. You can go to the next slide. Um, the plant on the right is one that's being helped by mycorrhizal fungi and there are a lot of positive thing, things happening to it. The one on the left um, is not as successful because it doesn't have this mycorrhizal fungi connection and when people use chemicals and pesticides that then kill the mycorrhizal fungi it actually ends up harming the plants themselves. Um, this is a cool example of how mycorrhizal fungi uh, gets all of these nutrients. They can actually drill into rocks. This is a super tiny rock. If you look at the measurement at the bottom, that's one tenth of a millimeter. So this is super small. And they drill into the rocks and they can secure um, a bunch of minerals in really crazy ways. So another way that plants communicate with each other is actually, no, this is mycorrhizal fungi using helping plants communicate with each other. Um, this is just one way that another way that they're super useful to plants. The plant in the middle is being attacked by, in this case, aphids, and the fungi is using um, this situation to communicate to the nearby plants that there's some kind of danger. The nearby plants then will send out defense signals to protect themselves against the aphids or whatever danger it might be. Um, so another cool way that trees especially communicate is through these terpenes. Um, and these are all carbon compounds that trees actually released to stimulate rainfall. And this is really interesting because if you think bigger scale, if you increase the leaf area index in the continents, um, then probably more of these terpenes will be released and more rain will be stimulated, which could be a long-term um, idea to cool in the planet. And I, I think you moisture in the ground. The, the good news about the oceans warming up is there's more moisture up there. So it's coming down in these big storms, but if the plants can modulate that and get them in places where we, the forests need them, that could be really cool. So, yeah. So. All right, so one other person that we talked a lot about in this class is Lynn Margulis. Um, and she expanded on Darwin's um, two, uh, basically, two um, what? Well, yeah, plants and animals. Plants and animals, yeah. So she expanded on Darwin's idea about that, but added in the importance of bacteria um, and made it this five kingdom idea. So Jonathan is gonna talk more about that. So I'm gonna hand it over to him. Thanks. So um, in this cover of the book uh, called Five Kingdoms by Lynn Margulis, we see uh, each of the fingers of the hand holding- uh, Thomas, 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 just a second. Uh, can you raise your, your microphone a little bit, the, the volume? Uh, I can't because it's based on your computer volume, not mine. Oh, okay. I'll try to, okay, good. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, each of the fingers um, represents one of the five kingdoms, and you can see that uh, the thumb, which is holding the earth, is actually the bacteria, because the bacteria are really what, um, what keeps this, this planet together. Uh, and Lynn Margulis liked to talk a lot about um, how all the different species collaborate together, whether they know it or not. <laughs> So here we see some people um, actually making an artificial beaver dam because beavers are such an essential part of many ecosystems. They uh, help, their dams help hold water um, in place, which then the trees can use to um, use the water and animals can drink from the uh, ponds formed by the beavers as well. And when there isn't enough water, the water, uh, sorry, when there aren't enough beavers, the water just runs off and forms these deep gouges, which we'll see again in a few slides. And in the next slide, we can see uh, that beavers can build dams really out of anything, including uh, mud and just reeds. And um, here in Nevada, they, there aren't that many trees, so they can just do that as well. 
And here's an example of what beavers can do to the landscape. You can see how much water there is compared to the nearby hillside. And the what looks like cliffs over there is actually the gouges formed by the water running off and taking away the soil. Mm, good. Let's see. And artificial dams also are um, not great for these ecosystems because things like mussels and fish um, can't really move up and down the streams. And so if we remove the dams, then uh, this can help with the restoration of mussels and other species. What, what is this thing right here? So that's a mussel actually imitate uh, that looks like a fish. So it can, um, uh, so it can attach to fish and then get carried. They can check upstream, yeah, cool. And so this is a wonderful um, beaver pond in actually Concord. Um, and we can see just how well the beavers do. And in this slide on the top, we see the range that beavers used to have all the way through North America, Canada, the United States, Europe, and even into Asia. And on the bottom right, we see that uh, that's a backyard that used to look like a golf course. And very quickly, the beavers, uh, when they were introduced there, they managed to turn it into wetlands. Mm. And here we have a few quotes on beaver. I'm just going to read a few sentences of it. There is, some, there is something that uh, in, the, in that persistent drive to sustain water on the landscape that is the clue for our own survival as a species. Whether we take the time to learn from other species depends on our own adaptability and willingness to see our world and the resources within us in a new light. From Glynis Hood, yeah, from Canada. And now uh, we are going to say the beaver pledge. <laughs> Sharda, do you want to start? Everybody has to unmute. Yes. I pledge allegiance to the streams. And the beaver ponds of America. To the renewal for which they stand. One river, underground, irreplaceable. With habitat and wetlands for all. So everybody say this, say it one more time. Go ahead. I pledge allegiance to the streams. And the beaver ponds of America. One river, un. Hold on, the chat is covering it. I can't see it. Underground, irreplaceable. With habitat and wetlands for all. So, oh, cool. Okay, so on this next slide, I'm going to be talking about what this means. So, this is a diagram of what the earth would look like if you took all the water out of it. Um, the large ball of water represents all of the water on Earth, um, if you took it out. Um, the medium ball represents um, basically all the fresh liquid water on the Earth. And the really small ball, the tiny one, um, basically represents the fresh water in lakes and rivers. And the point of this slide is to show that most people think there is more water on Earth than there really is. In this next slide, I'm going to be talking about the effects of COVID-19 on animals and the environment. Now, this is a photo of the night sky as seen above the Montmagantic International Dark Sky Reserve in Quebec, Canada. Um, the global COVID-19 quarantine has actually lowered the light and air pollution levels. Now the sky at night is much clearer and the stars are easier to find. So this is New Delhi and across many other cities in India as well, because of the small number of cars on the road, um, the much decreased smoke from factories, and because of uh, less dust from all those non-active construction sites due to the quarantining, um, the levels of air pollution have tremendously dropped. Now this is true for many other cities around the world, such as New York, uh, LA, Milan, Seoul, and Beijing. So uh, Thailand has actually discovered the largest number of these leatherback sea turtles in two decades on beaches lacking tourists because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so say environmentalists. In fact, in Thailand, which has 2,966 inf infections and 54 deaths as of today, uh, May 2nd, uh, travel curbs ranging from this ban on international flights are actually causing more people to be willing to stay home. Um, and because of that, the beaches are being freed up for all of wildlife. 
Okay, so the, this is a picture of uh, coyotes that have been wandering near the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, even before the pandemic, there had been a lot of coyotes in the area, but now they're becoming unafraid to go closer to the bridge. And in the past few weeks, uh, coyotes have actually been um, roaming all down the streets of San Francisco because it's so quiet and everything. Um, and they've been able to enjoy these kind of sights without worrying about humans. Uh, more and more fish are returning to bodies of water that humans aren't interfering with. For example, um, swans, waterfowl, and uh, dolphins are returning to the uh, previously murky waters of Venice. Now, this jellyfish has suddenly appeared in the Venice Canal, as you can see. Uh, during the coronavirus quarantining going on throughout all of Italy, there has been much less pollution, so these waters are becoming much clearer and much cleaner, too, allowing more sea life to pass through them. This is a picture of uh, goats that have been wandering the streets of Landidno, Wales. Um, in, the, uh, in the small town of, oh, I think you skipped a slide. Uh, oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> um, so uh, since Yosemite National Park is closed to visitors, um, like you can see there's a bear climbing a tree. Um, bears and other types of wildlife have been thriving here. In fact, um, Dane Peterson from the Awani Hotel in Yosemite said that the bear population has actually quadrupled. And in addition to bears, uh, there have been more bobcats and more coyotes, which have been also spotted. Um, the bears are now walking in areas that uh, were previously filled with tourists. And then uh, you, had, uh, you had this video you wanted me to show. I'm going to show, see if I can get this was uh, from the goats in Wales. I'm going to show you how to take this. Oh, darn. Three seconds. <laughs> So you can comment on that if you want, Jonathan. Yeah, so uh, basically um, all the, these herds of the great Orm Kashmiri goats um, are trotting around in this town uh, looking for food across the street. Um, and since people are all in their homes, uh, they see nothing wrong with uh, eating from bushes, um, as you can see there. Um, they also are very mischievous, people have noted, and they, uh, they climb walls, as you can see right here. And they go in people's yards and in their lawns, as you can see there. Pretty good wind on the microphone, yeah. So imagine if you lived in this house right here and you just see this little goat just trotting through your lawn. Wow. Somebody just commented, go goats. <laughs> there you go. So that's, uh, so you had your final scene there. Your, this is your final slide. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about um, how it relates to global warming now. So uh, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres was saying that the COVID-19 pandemic is actually exposing the true fragility of many countries. Uh, for example, right now, public health, uh, the climate, food security, education, and economic stability are all at stake now around the world. Um, Guterres says uh, that we have a rare and short window of opportunity to rebuild the world for the better. Um, so the biggest question now is, uh, what are we as a people going to do about this? That's a good question. Wow, thank you. This is great. Everybody, everybody did great. I've, I've got the... This reflects the first slide that we showed. Biodiversity can cool the planet. I think we've got a lot of evidence for that. The question is, will human decisions encourage planetary cooling? And uh, so we're talking grasslands, forests, wetlands, shorelines. We've got a lot of people already in this conference talking about rethinking agriculture, you know, the permaculture people, the holistic management, you know, cover crops are big, grazing is big. 
I wanted to say a word and shout out to John Todd, who really inspired me in his book, uh, Healing Earth. Uh, I've known John for about 30 years, 35 years, and he's always taught me a ton, and he finally published, which this is this book right here. And then we've got uh, Scenario 300, which uh, I put together to think about how do we return to 300 parts per million by 26, you know, atmospheric by 2061 when Halley's Comet comes back. And that's when you kids will be like 55, 60 years old. And, uh, you know, can we build a better world? And focus on the water cycle, I think, is going to be real important. And I want to, I want to finish off, I'm going to show a picture here of the Earthrise and how the astronauts thought, well, gosh, everybody we know lives on this little planet. And they felt kind of homesick on Christmas Eve in 1968. And this is, uh, this is how I keep track. When I'm feeling down about something, I just kind of re recite this, this four-line poem. There are those who try to set fire to our world. We are in danger. There is time only to move slowly. This is not a time to panic. This is the most challenging time in human history. There is time only to move slowly. There is no time not to love. And I really, Dina Metzger, um, oh shoot. <laughs> Dina Metzger was kind of a, another teacher. So, so um, that's uh, our presentation. And I'm not sure what we do now. I guess well, I'll we we um, have some time for uh, a few questions before we head off to our workshop. Oh, um, for the questions, before we start off, I'd just like to comment. Someone asked uh, uh, if you could use the Beaver Pledge. Um, and yeah, that's actually from a uh, Beaver uh, organization. So yeah, you can use that as well. That, yeah, that, that's uh, the Beaver Pledge comes from a little town of Martinez, California, and they want everybody to recite the Beaver Pledge, you know, at least once a week, I would think. So that'd be great. So uh, Adam, I'm, what do we do now? Okay, well, we can, uh, we can unshare your screen. <laughs> How do I unshare? There you go. Oh, so we're at your service. And oh. uh, people have questions. You can look uh, in the chat um, or um, just speak up. Uh, unmute yourself and, and speak up and Jim and the kids will respond. Um, can I just ask the group, um, when, you, when you confront this kind of really um, severe knowledge about the future, you talk about having 10, 10 years, um, and you get deeper into this and, and this demonstration shows an enormous enthusiasm and liveliness and sense of humor. Um, and I'm just wondering, where does this investigation leave you thinking about your own future and about what you want to do? Well, for me at least, um, based, I think we just have to see uh, how this all turns out, but I really want to uh, continue learning more about these subjects. And I'm not exactly sure what I want to do yet, but um, I'll have to determine that based on uh, what happens and I want to be prepared. Yeah, sometimes I've talked to my parents and said it feels a little unfair that it's something I should have to be so worried about right now um, because I do have a lot of other interests that aren't, I'm not necessarily a sciencey person, but I feel like we all that our, my entire generation has a lot of responsibility in it. Um, and so it's hard to figure out, you know, we all have to be involved in, in some degree, um, but how involved do we really have to be and what kind of a difference can we really make? It's, it's just hard to know. So I guess that's what I'm thinking is like, it's just hard. Anybody else? Um, someone asked in the chat if, uh, uh, if Jim could put up the picture of Julia Butterfly Hill again. Uh, Astrid, where did you actually find that picture? <laughs> I think Jim found that picture. Jim actually what? gave me the book. It's called The Legacy of Luna. I would recommend everybody read it. It's so inspiring. Um, 
But I think Jim found the picture originally, but she's just chilling in the tree. I'd have to, I'd have to share my screen again, so. I, I think Luna was the name of the tree. Yeah, Luna was the name of the tree. Uh, I got that, actually, these are pictures of a recent article that was done uh, either in the New York Times or whatever, but I can, I can send that out. Uh, if, if you come to our, um, our workshop here, uh, I, I can search that down. Oh, and someone else also asked uh, how we selected our topics. For me, at least, I just like beavers. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, I was, for me, I was, uh, ever since the pandemic started, um, I was trying to think of ways that they kind of um, work against each other because you know we've been we've we've thought about um, before the pandemic that you know global warming is the number one problem on Earth right now. And it still is, but since uh, this virus is more of an uh, immediate problem right now, um, we've been focusing on it uh, so much. Um, so I was trying to think, is there anything good coming out of this? And I was trying, and I've heard some theories about how um, because of global warming, coronavirus will stop soon um, just because of the summer heat, but there's not enough evidence to really prove that one. Um, so I was, I did it the other way and I was trying to, um, think about basically how um, how coronavirus is helping solve the climate crisis. So, yeah. Hmm. Well, just just so you guys know, however helpless you may feel, however uh, uncertain you are of the future, simply by doing this kind of work, you're having an effect on us. So, thank you. Hmm. And your friends and many people who you don't even realize you're having an effect on. I, I just want to say something brief about coronavirus and climate yeah. and that part of um, my understanding and I think Bio for Climate's position is that they are both symptoms of massive destruction of the ecosystem, uh, global ecosystems. and. Um, as such, what we really have to do is restore all the biodiversity we've been talking about today so that global warming and the plague of viruses is no longer necessary from nature's perspective to restore a balance. I would also add that education is one of the most powerful tools there is. And seeing this teaching from young people, I think has great power and great force. And I hope you'll continue because this was a superb presentation. Yes, I loved I would, it too. I, I also wanted to respond to Adam's, I wanted to agree with what Adam said about the coronavirus and, um, and the climate crisis. Uh, what I see as, as a quote unquote benefit of the coronavirus is that it's reminding us of the reality that all of us are connected by our breath, that your breath can, uh, has enormous reach, and that how you use your breath impacts everybody around the globe. And so what the coronavirus is doing, it's tearing down these silos uh, these conceptual silos that we have built for ourselves to think that we can just do our own thing and no one else is affected. Uh, whereas that's just no, that's just not true. And so I love the way you, you know, your presentations gave us some tools, you know, because we need to do something. We need not just talk, we need to do something. And so you gave us some very simple tools that we can use. So thank you so much. I'd like to thank them too and thank you all because. Um, I think that your model for teaching and your projects, which are so inspiring, and your voices are really models for how all of science teaching in schools should be done, that it should be outside of the classroom in the world. And I mean, think of the difference that people would feel about science in general, and our nation would be more science literate if every you know, school from elementary to high school had to adopt rivers and had to adopt forests and had to rebuild ecosystems in their community from the ground up. 
and work with their community councils. You see students getting plastic bans in their communities on the East Coast and things because they see the plastic in the ocean. And I just think that we've put science, locked it in labs and classrooms and, and made it individual little topics like, okay, we spend an hour on sunlight or something and we don't have an integrated systems-based teaching of science and hands-on based outdoor science. So your model could go into regular classrooms as well, not just homeschools. And if the world had a different way of approaching science education that was more well-rounded and integrated to all topics, reading, arts, politics, community, democracy, think what we would do. You guys would teach communities and your parents if we, if, if we let you do it. I mean, and if we had been taught that way instead of inside a classroom. So I just have to put out a call for changing how we think of science education in general in a more integrated systems and hands-on fashion. Mary Beth, thank you very much. I would also like to say that when I first started doing this five years ago, uh, we were doing AP biology and it was very much the model of, we were grinding out biology and the kids were teaching me that that wasn't the best way to teach. And uh, that I had more wisdom inside me of all these experiences I had that I could share with them and the living machines and all that kind of stuff. And it. Uh, uh, they really taught me. It's like, uh, how do we, how do we learn to listen from, uh, and, and how do we find the joy in everybody, the curiosity in everybody? So this is great. And, th and that's, uh, you know, I, I thought they did really well today. And for whatever it's worth, Jim did his teaching his way. And those kids passed AP exams way over their quote unquote grade. <laughs> yeah, they there were some really young ones that, that have done that. That's really good. And I just uh, wanted to support. Oh, go ahead, Jim. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to support um, what uh, Mary Beth was saying, what you were saying. Uh, a lot of people, for instance, don't like chemistry very much because it just seems so unrelated to the real world. And you all are showing how very much or critically it is related to the real world. It seems to me if more academic subjects were taught that way, uh, and, and not just in the sciences, but in this integrated fashion, school would be a much more, I think, um, lively, real um, institution and opportunity for students uh, who would really enjoy school rather than feel like it's something we just have to get through. So thank you again for being that kind of model. Uh, just as an FYI, Jed is our education director and he's working on a project in Martha's Vineyard to bring kids to farms. There's what, another idea too. It's not just chemistry, it's biology also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would, think, I would think they should be taught together and that's a, a more integrated that chemistry isn't apart from biology and, and all the, you know, uh, zoology and everything. So, and the mic, Mitochondria and everything else. So, thank That's you. But biology had to to work with the the rules of chemistry, and chemistry follows the rules of physics, which are very hard to understand. You know, sometimes because of the quantum stuff. We, there's stuff we can't measure yet, and maybe you never will. But the idea that life figured out a way to live on this little rock out in the middle of space, and with without a lot of water to work with, and uh, you know, it, it managed to make a place that's habitable for humans you know eventually the climate got cold enough that humans could live here and that's kind of the thing i wonder about is uh you know sharda was talking about the dinosaurs they were used to much warmer climate and um you know this was the land of the reptiles before and so us mammals have something you know it would really help us if we uh kept the planet somewhat cooler than uh, what we might be heading towards so